Our good friend and the legend Trevor Sikama is going to join us on a Tuesday episode of Locked On Lions. You are Locked On Lions, your daily Detroit Lions podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Here we go, everybody. Week two of OTAs is here. Matt Derry with you. It is another episode of Locked On Lions right here on the Locked On Podcast Network. Happy Memorial Day, everybody. And now we're after that. We're here on Tuesday, May the 30th, and Wednesday, May the 31st. For those of you watching on our Locked On Lions YouTube channel, you see our guest on the screen, Trevor Sikama, going to join us from PFF Pro Football Focus, Locked On Lions today. Brought to you by FanDuel Sportsbook, official sportsbook of the NFL. Make every moment more. By visiting fanduel.com slash locked on. Do that today to get started. You can follow us on Twitter at Derry Speaks, D E R Y Speaks at Locked On Lions, the Matt Derry Facebook fan page as well. And again, shout out to our everydayers that are out there that watch us on the YouTube channel or listen wherever you get your podcast. Trevor Sikama is a Locked On alum. He is now big time. I saw him the other day on the NFL Network. Then Dave Selfaro from PFF's like, Do you know this guy? Do you want to have him on? I'm like, Never heard of him. <laughs> Look at you, big time uh, on, on on the NFL Network the other day. But uh, Trev, always good to see you, buddy. Somebody's got to keep me humble. Lord knows it's not me. No, I'm. I, I appreciate it, Matt. I appreciate <laughs> anytime you uh you ask me to come on the show. It's always a good time. Tell me about. So you were on actually pretty recently last week talking about the Lions, and you said, "Hey, they're they're going to the postseason, huh?" Yeah, so I wrote an article last week for PFF.com, and it was giving a reason why every team in the NFL either will or won't make the playoffs. And when it came to the Detroit Lions, I gave them a they will make the playoffs. And it's because, well, they were close last year, and a lot of those reasons that got them close are still there or even expanded upon, you know, upgraded a little bit. The one area that was really holding them back last year was their defense and it was that pass coverage right 245 passing yards allowed per game that was the third worst mark in the nfl and they really went after that hard this offseason cam sutton emmanuel mosley brian branch cj gardner johnson like i love all of those additions just getting new blood in there anyways i think was really good I, you know moving on from jeff akuda you know some people would say like okay it's a little bit early like i still think that there's something left in the tank for akuda but I also get the fresh start part of it, right? You're drafted so high. It doesn't work out. You've got the injury. And yeah, sometimes I think everybody out there in life knows this. A new environment can sometimes just breed the best results. You know, when you're stuck in the same environment, sometimes it's just not going to take you where you want to go. So the Lions, even moving on from him, just getting fresh faces in there in the secondary, attacked their greatest weakness. And ultimately, I think that this is one of the more complete rosters in the NFL. Now, I don't know if it's the best, but you look around the roster now, especially with the upgrades they made, and you say, all right, there's not really an area where I can go, yes, that's a huge weakness of the Lions right now. They just feel like a very complete team. Uh, so, Still obviously room to grow, and we're going to see how much they're going to be able to grow this upcoming season. But uh, those changes that they made to the secondary are why I think they're going to make the playoffs this year. Is there one move that you like the most with that secondary? You named them all, but is there somebody that you think, man, that is just the fit. That's, that's the best move they've made. If Emmanuel Mosley is healthy, I think he is a really damn good corner. And so, you know, his health obviously goes into this, but especially recently when he was playing with the 49ers, like his play as of late was really good. I think the same for Cam Sutton, right? And that's a player who can give you inside out versatility as well. I know I'm kind of cheating here and saying both of those guys, but if I had to rank them, I would say that the Mosley pick was the one or the Mosley addition was the one I liked the most. Not only was it a great bargain because he's coming off of injury, they get him for a lower price tag, but I think the ceiling is up there, man. I think he could be a CB one type of player in this league. And certainly if he's healthy, I think, what he'll be able to do for that secondary is going to take him a long way. Yeah, they're kind of easing Mosley back here in OTAs, coming back, like you said, from that leg injury. Jerry Jacobs is playing now on the other side of Sutton, but you got to figure Mosley's going to be out there. What about Gardner Johnson in terms of the fit? Where would you play him? I know they've talked about nickel. They've talked about a third safety in some mm -hmm. situations, maybe on a second long or something like that. He's going to be on the field. We know that. Yeah, no, there's no doubt about it. And that versatility is why you bring him in, right? He's not just this safety who's going to play on the back end for you. He's also a really nice slot defender. And the thing that I love the most about C.J. Garner-Johnson is 
he'll get up your face, man. Like he is a trash talker, and that is a prerequisite for cornerbacks. If I was building a team, man, I, I I've talked to corners, uh, you know, whether it be for feature pieces or whether scouting them or whether it's at the senior bowl or whatever it is. And I always gravitate toward those guys who have that kind of confidence because the longer I've studied the position and, and the longer that I've just kind of observed some of the best in the league, you've got to believe you're the best player on the field. If you're a cornerback, you have to, I mean, like think of the job that you have to have, whether it's a slot player or a guy on the outside, you are told to go guard a wide receiver. And you don't know where he's going. You don't know what the release is going to be. You don't know what the route is. You don't know what the timing of the route is. The wide receiver does. The wide receiver knows all of these things. The quarterback throwing them the ball knows exactly when they're supposed to throw them the ball. And then it's your job as a corner to stay in front of them, to stay with them, and then not allow them to catch the ball. It seems incredibly difficult when you bring it down to that kind of elementary, fundamental level of playing the cornerback position. So the guys that bring that swagger, that confidence, and that often boils over to a little bit of trash talk, I love love that about those guys that play the position because it is one of those where you got to have short-term memory and you got to have a ton of confidence. CJ Garner Johnson is that type of player. So mentality alone, I love what he is bringing to the secondary. That's the kind of mentality that they're going to want to build off of. I'd probably play him as a slot defender because I feel like that is where he is at his best. But like you were mentioning, you can get a lot of versatility out of him doing a lot of different things. Trevor Sikama with us, Pro Football Focus, PFF.com. I want to get into some things uh, that, that was on PFF that Trevor had a hand in with the wide receivers. We'll do that in a little bit, but I want to stay with the defense for a second. Where are you on linebackers? You know, in Chicago down the road here and in the division, everybody's raving about the Bears linebacker pickups. Here are the Lions, who we thought they loved Rodrigo, Malcolm Rodriguez. We thought they loved Alex Anzalone bringing him back, but here they, they draft Jack Campbell in the first round. What'd you think of that? And, you know, with Derek Barnes also in the mix, there's got to be an odd man out there, don't you think? Yeah, I, I did not think that that Campbell was going to get picked that early. Now, going through the entire pre-draft process, I did mention this. You know, the linebacker class, the pool of linebackers to pick from in the 2023 NFL draft was very different. I was, I was fascinated to see how the NFL was going to go about picking these guys, how they were going to prioritize them, because there just weren't a ton of those true off-ball linebacker types you know those guys who are between the tackles that when you when you think of a linebacker it's those types of players like exactly what jack campbell is honestly you had drew sanders who was a linebacker edge hybrid uh demarvian overshone who was a safety linebacker hybrid trent simpson the same thing safety linebacker hybrid you had so many of these hybrid players there just weren't a t- if you wanted an off-ball linebacker that you could legitimately start in year one Campbell was basically the only one that you could pick from. And that's why I did think there was a strong chance that he made it to the back end around one. Didn't think that he was going to go top 20, but clearly they got a plan for him. Sure. I bet they like Alex Anzalone, but the injury history, it, it, it's tough to totally ignore how injury prone that he has been. You got to have a little bit more of a rotation in your line with your linebackers. Anyways, I like Barnes a lot, but I think that Barnes has given some great work as a pass rusher as well. So I know they'll use him in a lot of different situations. So really, you know, you got to have at least two linebackers on the field with Malcolm Rodriguez. And then who's the other one? I think sometimes it'll certainly be Alex Anzalone because of that, his athleticism and what that could do for you in coverage. But if he ever, ever goes down, I don't know if they would want Barnes to be fully just an off-ball linebacker type. I think they want him to be a little bit of a hybrid for you. So then Campbell really steps into that role, and I know people are freaking out about it on on draft day when they go with a running back and then a linebacker with their first two <laughs> picks. But oh yeah, you know, for this Lions team specifically, there is certainly a path to where they're going to get a lot of run out of this guy. They're going to make the most out of that selection for sure with Jack Campbell. Trevor Sikama with us. I want to get into some offense uh, with him as well. And certainly this uh, DeAndre Hopkins uh, rumors. I don't think there's anything to it, but I want to ask him about it coming up next. I want to tell you, though, about our friends at FanDuel. No better place to get in on the action here is the NBA Finals are starting up. Denver and Miami, then America's number one sports book, and that would be FanDuel. Right now, FanDuel is giving new customers a no-sweat first bet up to $1,000. It's up to $1,000 back in bonus bets if your first bet doesn't win. Go to FanDuel.com slash LockedOn to sign up today to kind of claim that no sweat first bet. Could be anything with this series, Nuggets and Heat, Jokic points, Jamal Murray, point spreads, money lines, whatever you want. It's all there for you on an app, too, that is safe, secure, and super easy to use. Don't miss your shot. No sweat first bet up to $1,000. When you join FanDuel today, just go to FanDuel.com slash LockedOn to sign up. 
Make every moment more with FanDuel. Trevor Sycamore with us from PFF. Lions, Lockdown Lions, Tuesday. Lions, uh, according to Trevor, are going to the playoffs. Do you have them winning the division, by the way? Is that... Uh, that, that's your uh, take as well? I do. I have them winning the division. I think that it is theirs for the taking this year. You see a little bit of a dip back with the Packers, obviously going very young on offense with Jordan Love and the rest of that receiving core there. I think the Vikings going to take a step back as well. Not exactly sure what that offensive identity is going to be, if they're going to be able to remain as potent as they were the year before. And then I don't think Chicago is quite there yet. I, I still think they're a year away from really contending. And that just leaves the Lions as the favorites in that division, if you ask me. Where are you on, the, as I like to call them, the Hall of Fields, Justin Fields, who everybody in Chicago thinks is a Hall of Famer already? <laughs> <laughs> Look, I like Justin Fields, and uh, I was pretty high on him coming out of the draft. And, you know, with him showing how great of a rusher he was in this past year, earned an elite rushing grade for us in our metric at over 1,000 yards on the ground. And, and that's really good to see because – you know, when I projected of what he was going to be at the NFL level, uh, sure, he had that rushing ability. But when you go back to that final season at Ohio State, it's not like that's all he was, right? There have been college quarterbacks before who were these just one read and tuck it kind of players. And you go like, okay, well, it looks good when they hit the one read. No, Justin Fields was making full field reads. He was going through progressions at Ohio State. He was good as a passer, as a field manager, and then as a rusher as well. The passing and how he has seen the field, clearly it is taking him longer than it is just him winning with his athletic ability. But I do still have faith that that is going to come because I did see it at Ohio State. It's not like we're asking him to become a passer that we've never seen before. I do think we saw some of that at Ohio State, and I'm just waiting to see more of it at the NFL level. All right, so the Cardinals were trying to trade DeAndre Hopkins. No suitors they have to release him and eat $22 million. Some publications have said, oh, the Lions are a fit. Obviously, Jamison Williams out the first six weeks. Mm -hmm. uh, DJ Chark left. Um, do you see D Detroit being a fit for D-Hop? I, I think it would be. I, I don't know any sort of cap implications or where they are. I haven't looked up where they are, like cap space-wise or what it would take. But, shoot, even with Jamison Williams in there, if you've got DeAndre Hopkins play as an X on the line of scrimmage, You've got Jameson Williams playing off the line of scrimmage on the outside, and then you got Amon Rice St. Brown being an extremely versatile player who you know can have a great home in the slot. Like that's that's a really nice receiver trio that you have there that you can work off of, as well as the rest of the guys who kind of build out that depth. So would it make sense for the Lions on paper and in a vacuum? Yeah, it absolutely would. I still think that okay, maybe Hopkins isn't exactly the wide receiver one, best wide receiver in the NFL type of player he was. A couple of years ago but for the lions you know you're acquiring as much talent as you possibly can to score as many points as you can because you're trying to go to the postseason right you're trying to play in january and at that point you start playing against some of the best teams in the nfc on a regular basis and deandre hopkins can help you do that so i don't know where they are cap space wise but in terms of paper depth chart what he could bring to the table yeah they should be absolutely looking into it you look at the the offense, and, and and you guys wrote about uh, you know top receivers in the game, and Amon Ross St. Brown cracked the top fifteen, and that's saying something when you talk about his size and certainly where he was drafted in the fourth round. But how how do you kind of look at where uh, you know the sun god is in terms of, of of ranking? And that's difficult to do with all these good wide receivers in this in this sport, don't you think? Man, there are so many good wide receivers in this league, but Amon Ross St. Brown is absolutely one of them. I mean, what he is able to do from a flexibility standpoint, when you give him those two-way goes with a lot of space in the middle. I mean, he, he is just somebody who has continuously rewarded them uh, heavily. And now, of course, like the yards per target are lower than it is for other outside wide receivers, but that's just the nature of the beast when you're playing from the slot. You're often the guy that, okay, if extra pressure's coming, this is where I'm going to look first. This is going to be my safety valve. And that is extremely important as a player, as reliable as what St. Brown has been especially this past season. So he took a leap into the elite category here and an elite receiving grade for us this past year. And I think that that's something that's going to absolutely continue because you go back to his USC days. That was something that I noted when I was scouting him is it's like, okay, I'm a little worried that he doesn't have the imposing athleticism to be a major difference maker as an outside receiver. Cause a lot of the, at USC, there was a point in time where they were using him as like tr a true wide receiver one an outside wide receiver type of player. And I went, man, I just don't know if he has the overall athleticism to really win 
off the line of scrimmage and then continue to threaten vertically with vertical speed in the slot. He doesn't have to do that. He basically just gets to do what he does best, which is short area quickness, creating those quick throwing windows, really reliable hands. And then he becomes a great playmaker after the catch. Once he gets the ball. So it really is just, it's a perfect situation with him. Ben Johnson, the offensive coordinator, clearly using him to his best abilities and to his strengths. And so it's been fun to watch St. Brown really take over that offense. Are you disappointed in Jamison Williams? Uh, got healthy last year, but didn't see the field much. There was some talk and some buzz about not working as hard as some of the other guys. And guys like Josh Reynolds and Chark and other others earned more time. And then now he's out six weeks with the gambling suspension. So, you know, obviously he's still a young kid. I don't think anybody's giving up on him, but a little bit, a little bit of disappointment there for, for him, you think? Yeah, I mean, I, I'm disappointed in it simply as somebody who loves watching Jamison Williams play. I think he's an incredible talent. I was l- really excited to see what he was going to be in this offense. And now, you know, it's not like he's off the team or anything. You know, he's going to come back midway through the season. But that's a lot of missed time that he could have been really getting acclimated with what he was going to be in this offense and how to use him correctly. Because that speed, that takeover ability, it showed out at Alabama. And it still could be that in the NFL. But for a myriad of different reasons. We just haven't seen it yet, but yeah, I'm disappointed about it. I'm disappointed about any player that gets in trouble for gambling because look, as much as I think it's kind of silly, right? You know, you're like you, for these guys who are betting on sports that aren't even the one that they play in. Sure. It, it's, it, it's kind of silly when you look at it like that, but from all the accounts, they have been told you cannot do this. You right. cannot in the, in the gamble building. right, right. In, right. In, in 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 any way, shape, or form when you are on the job, if you will. And yeah. so, with that being said, it's just like God. I, I just wish that you wouldn't have done that because <laughs> obviously now we're just missing a big chunk of a season that um, can still certainly be exciting for him. But you're you're just missing a lot of games that I think could have really helped out this team. Gibbs and Laporta, how do you think they fit? And uh, what were your thoughts on, on where they were taken? Yeah, so Gibbs went a lot a lot sooner than I thought that he was going to go. But he's a really great talent. I had him as a top 20 player overall in the class, and he's one of the most dynamic players that is there. Um, you know, in a class that didn't necessarily bring a lot of juice at the receiver position in the 2023 NFL draft, I wondered how early the league was going to dip into a guy like Jameer Gibbs because – he was dynamic. He just didn't play receiver. He played running back out of the backfield. And clearly they wanted to go that direction very early. They wanted to get faster out of the backfield. That was the prioritization. So I think that they're going to lean on him a ton. And then Laporta, man, he's a really nice receiver. He's really good after the catch. Again, you talk about I'm on Ross St. Brown being a big time playmaker after the catch. Laporta is as well. And, you know, when this team trades TJ Hawkinson last year, I don't think it was because they didn't want to emphasize the tight end position in the receiving game. I think just they just didn't want to pay him, right? And they knew that what was coming up for him, and they didn't want to give him that contract. So Laporta, now on a four-year rookie deal, they're going to get this guy involved in the offense because of the receiver that he is. So he is somebody who, for fantasy football players out there, like I, I don't know if he's going to be winning your league or anything, but he might be an X factor for you, right? This, this is a player who I wonder if you can play every single week because he's going to be getting these kinds of looks especially with Jamison Williams not in the lineup for six weeks, right? I think that they're going to really say, hey, I'm on Ross St. Brown's going to get a decent chunk of the pie of our targets that we're going to give out every single week. But after that, whoever's going to earn him in practice is going to earn him in practice. And I think it's going to be a wide open competition. So I think that that um, gives even more room for Gibbs to get involved in the passing game. And then it also opens the door for a guy like Laporte to really hit the ground running. Want to ask Trevor uh, coming up next about Jared Goff, certainly Dan Campbell as well, and that opener uh, in Kansas City. First, though, our friends at Built Bar. Trevor knows this. You're looking for a delicious snack. Don't want all the sugar and calories and get yourself the best tasting protein bar on the market, and that is Built. Healthy, tastes amazing, all dipped in 100% dark chocolate. That's right, real chocolate to come in great flavors. And all you got to do is go to Built.com. You put in that promo code of LOCK15, and you'll get 15% off your first order now built bars are available to you at walmart and at sam's club you know i love that cookies and cream bar and the built puffs are unbelievable just ordered the coconut brownie chunk puff the marshmallow treats that are only about 130 calories you cannot beat that four grams of sugar a whopping 17 grams of protein go to built.com put in the promo code locked 15 again and get 15 percent off your first order of built bars 
Trevor Sikama from Pro Football Focus. We love our friends at PFF. Go to pff.com. All right, uh, real fast on Jared Goff. Obviously, Hendon Hooker is there now. This is mm-hmm. not going to be some quarterback controversy or competition, but you have two more years left of Goff. How do you think the Lions play this? Yeah, I'm I'm excited to see Jared Goff this year because you get to see whether last year was it was kind of more of the same for him because he ended the year really strong. I think it was in the last six weeks, he had five games where he was over 75 passing grade at PFF system, which is good. I mean, that's, that's a really good stretch of games, a couple of games in the 80s there. So clearly playing well as the season went on, as he got even more comfortable. But, you know, I know people look at the – high touchdown to low interception ratio at PFF. We have some more context stats to that. We call big time throws versus turnover worthy plays. And he had 18 big time throws to 24 turnover worthy plays. So that's not the ratio that you want. Although he ended the season on a high note. So that's why I say I'm really looking forward to what we're going to see from him this upcoming season, because you're right. You have two years contractually with Jared Goff where you could ride with him, but if things kind of look stagnant or if they see the ceiling with Jared Goff and they think that, hey, maybe Hendon Hooker might have a higher ceiling, they could make a switch as soon as next offseason. So it all just depends how he plays this year. It's got to be another step in the right direction for him, but it's one that uh, I'm looking forward to watching. You're Dan Campbell. You now know that you're going to be playing the world champs in front of everybody. (laughs) The Lions are opening the season, Trevor. This is insane. Uh, But... what do you, as a coach, and as 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 you've gotten to watch Dan Campbell, how do you think he goes into this game, and 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 what will he use as motivation? And also, too, it's a brand new secondary having to face Mahomes in the first game. That's not going to be easy either. I think it's the perfect game to start the season for them. I really do because it is a team that finally has legit playoff aspirations. You're playing the world champs right off the bat, and basically you're telling you're you're basically telling this team, hey. This is the first of two times that we're going to see this team this year. It's going to be the first game of the regular season. It's going to be the last game in the Super Bowl, right? And like, <laughs> and you and you tell you tell wow. your team this, and you go, "This is the standard. This is how we're going to start the season. You're going to go up against the best quarterback in the world in Patrick Mahomes, and we're going to we're, that, like this is the standard that we have to be at all season long. And so that's kind of the motivation that I would have for this team. It's like Rex Ryan kind of said in that clip that went viral, you know, he's like, he's like, Oh, you know, everybody likes to say, Oh, you, you like to be the underdog. It's the underdog. And he's like, he's like, forget that. He's like, you want to be at the top. You want it when expectations are high, because that tells you who's ready for it. And who's not, you want the target on your back. You always want to face the best. And it tells you where you are as a team. So I think that that's something like that. I'm not Dan Campbell. He's a lot better at it than I am, but <laughs> that's kind of the message that I would give to the team. Trev, great to see you. Thanks for uh, doing this, and uh, keep up the great work at PFF. Yeah, appreciate it, Matt. Anytime, my friend. Trevor Sick, I'm a pro football focus on Twitter, at Tampa Bay Trey, T-R-E. That's a Tuesday edition of Locked on Lions. We're back again tomorrow.